you know, I always like being the last one to come on stage because I know that the right place to sit is where I am not on anyone's lap. So that's, <laughs> it, makes it makes it a lot easier. Um, like a lot of cities, uh, Charlotte is grappling with a series of intertwined issues about the level of incarceration, the level of crime, uh, the relations between the police and communities, particularly the African American community, and the level of opportunity in a place that is growing uh, and adding jobs, ensuring that those opportunities are available uh, to all of the communities uh, in, uh, in the area. So let me start with a question. And when you think about those, those intertwined set of challenges, which seems to you today the most urgent in Charlotte, and how do they uh, intersect? Uh, Kevin, maybe you could start us off. <clears throat> well, obviously, um, my viewpoints are colored by the work that I do. I've been a uh, criminal defense lawyer, specifically a public defender, since 1989. So the most pressing uh, to me is, at first, and it's starting already to happen, an awakening and an acknowledgement that we do have racial disparities in outcomes. We do have policies which have racial impacts directly. Um, and that is step one to at least acknowledge it. Uh, your community leaders in the criminal court system have at least gotten that far. Um, they're willing to say they're not happy with it. Uh, where we go from here is, what do you do about it? Mm -hmm. Judge? Well, uh, when I was in law school, one of the cases that we studied early on with respect to uh, discrimination, employment discrimination, things like that, was the case right from here in Charlotte, Griggs versus Duke Power. Mm -hmm. And the legal concept that was created by that uh, case was one about disparate impact. Facially neutral policies that have a disparate impact on certain segments of the community. So uh, one of the things that we've been looking at from the bench is whether policies that we have been following for years. I mean, when I came on the bench, you know, there were certain things that you were expected to do. For instance, setting bonds. Well, you know, this particular uh, offense has this bond associated to it at a minimum. And so what we've begun looking at is that seems pretty simple and facially neutral as far as race or ethnicity or anything like that. But what is the actual implement, uh, uh, what's the actual consequence of implementing that with respect to various segments of our community? So we are really taking a very close look as, as part of the system here on whether what we're doing is having an impact on mem uh, certain segments of the community. So, oh, okay. oh. And so, Sorry, Robert. Yeah, didn't go to Robin. Yeah, ladies first. We're okay, in Charlotte. go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think about the way things are different now. Uh, I'm, I'm at the district attorney's office, and I joined the office about 11 years ago. And prior to that, I was a criminal defense attorney as well. Uh, and I, I was uh, anticipating uh, this panel today, and as I was thinking about it last night. I realized that 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when I joined the office, the concept of implicit bias was not anything I had really heard of. Um, it's really something that has come about uh, in, in the last uh, several years and how important that is, particularly in the criminal justice system and as it relates to uh, each of our agencies that make up the criminal justice system. Uh, the district attorney's office uh, takes that uh, concept to heart and is very concerned about the concept of implicit bias and we've done a lot of training around that we've we've brought folks into our office um, uh, John Powell came and, and did uh, an implicit bias training for all of our attorneys uh, we have to protect ourselves against the thing that we don't even realize we're engaging in right it's it's what we don't know that is probably the scariest thing uh, and so w one of the other things that was very important in our office was to insulate uh, cases that uh, Kevin's attorneys may be defending against from any single one person's implicit bias. So we engaged in a process of uh, roundtabling all of our cases so that you bring a group of people to uh, do a formal analysis of a case 
before it moves along in the system. Uh, I think the recognition of implicit bias. And now, just stop you there. And explain a little bit about that process. So when you say you bring a group of people together to decide sure. what, what charge to bring or whether to bring the charge. Well, the, the charge has already uh, been brought right. uh, by, by law enforcement. Uh, our attorneys get together in the teams. So we, we have several different teams based around subject matter uh, expertise, if you will. And they come together as a group anywhere from five to 12 or more attorneys will sit around and, and analyze a drug case or, or a crimes against persons case or a property case and make the determination which direction does this case need to go. And we look at what's going on with the defendant, um, the, the value of, uh, of the case, if you will. Um, what's their prior record? Uh, what circumstances do they find themselves in? that may have uh, contributed to, to this act, uh, the, to this potential criminal act. Um, so so that, that, that's the type of practice we go through to make sure we don't have a single implicit bias issue that's uh, at play. Robert, how do these pieces fit together in your mind? So when we sit here and we look at Charlotte, I mean, just no holes barred, being honest. We study stuff to death. We talk about every few years we come back and we get right back where we were again. Oh my God, that's a problem, let's study it. <laughs> you know, and for people that work in the community and we knock doors, it's been led for most of the people in the community losing faith in the system. You know, everybody now sits here and said that there's this report that came out from Berkeley and Harvard that said Charlotte is uh, 50th in um, upper mobility. Upper mobility. But how did that surprise you? We started doing quality of life studies every year since 1992. If you couldn't look at the data and say, oh, this might be a problem. It's only a problem when people from the outside say, Charlotte, you have a problem. And that's when people decide, <laughs> and that's when people decide, oh my God, we gotta get busy. You can't sit back and say that we have a problem with upward mobility when education problems started when we got rid of Swan versus Board of Education. Mm -hmm. So that started then and you let it go for 20 years and then you say, oh my God, we have a problem with education. We knew when we built Charlotte that we were building jobs. My wife luckily works for, Bank of, uh, works for Wells Fargo, was Bank of America, mm -hmm. but that's something. Mm -hmm. You get downsized in Charlotte quick. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully, you rotate through the banks, Bank of America, then Wells Fargo, then bb &T, but you get to work. But my point is, <laughs> but the point is, my wife had the ability to do that. When I first moved to Charlotte in 1996, you could go up and down the North Tryon Corridor, and you could find jobs that other yeah. people worked at. Those jobs don't exist anymore. So now we sit back again 20 years later and say, well, how come people can't afford these jobs? Well, you only made jobs for MBAs. And now you want to know why the people in the neighborhoods are upset. And that's, Mark, we were talking about this. You work with, you work with young, young people uh, many, uh, who, have, who have been, who have interacted with the criminal justice system. Uh, this is a city that, according to the Brookings Institution, ranks in the top 15 of all the 100 largest metros in job creation since 2010. Rob ranks, I think, 14th in total increase in the economic output of the region since 2010, added 100,000 people in the last five years, many of them brought in from around the country. How relevant is any of that growth to, to the kids you work with? Do they see it as something they can access and benefit from, or is it happening somewhere else? Okay, so the children that, that I get a chance to work with and the families, all of our children are referred to as through the juvenile court system. So they have a record of some sort, and they get a small fine, some cases of felonies. them to make the connection to what's happening in Charlotte. They grew up in this city, they know this city, this is their home. But what they've experienced in the juvenile court system and their social economic status with their families, they can't make that connection. Um, one thing that I'd like to share with regards to uh, implicit bias and how we arrived at this point, how is Charlotte talking about uh, race and justice and Lamont Scott shooting? It starts with the individual. Um, the analogy I like to use is we're under the influence of something. What is, that, what is that influence? Anytime we come to a situation and we interact with another individual, we're bringing our own individual issues to that situation. And if we have not checked ourselves, if we're not in balance, 
just like in a car accident when somebody's under the influence of alcohol or drugs, that's going to be a major problem. And in some cases, you can leave someone completely destroyed. So with these children who've experienced with the juvenile court system issues, we come in and we solve this situation. We want to help put their lives back together and paint that picture to say, this is your city. And you don't have to be ashamed of the mistakes you made. It's going to be all right. We'll put you back together. Yeah. Um, let me talk about, let's now talk about each of these different areas uh, individually, um, starting with, with incarceration. Uh, the, the community has, has received the grant from MacArthur. They've made a commitment to reduce the, uh, the jail population I think, by 13% over the next uh, uh, two years. Now, over the last couple of years, it, that had been declining, but since early 2016, uh, it has been going back up. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, since early 2016, it's about 20% higher uh, than it was then. What's the larger trend? I mean, are, are you seeing a reduction in your population in the jail? Is this a blip? And what will it take to meet the kind of goals of reduction that you have, you have set out? Kevin, can you start us, maybe? Yeah, and I, should, I want to back up and say, as the uh, public defender, you're a public defender in Mecklenburg County, I don't consider myself a part of this system. Mm -hmm. And I don't call it Ooh. the criminal justice system. I call it the criminal court system. It hasn't earned the right to be called the justice system yet. <laughs> That being said, we do have some good people in that system, and uh, where I can, I do look to collaborate uh, with them on efforts to improve. Um, there comes a time where collaboration isn't enough, and talking needs to end, and action needs to be taken. That is sometimes the role of the defense. We need to litigate some of these issues. If people aren't willing to move beyond talking, then we need to go into court and litigate and get action, and forced action. Um, but to get to your point about uh, the jail, uh, we have a, a realization and awakening that we have so many people in jail, not because they're charged with a crime, but because they're poor. Um, I've had judges, when I've been in court recently making this argument, say to me, no, Mr. Tully, your client is in jail because he got charged with those four crimes. And I said, yes, but a person who's charged with those same four crimes is sitting at home on his couch right now because he had the money to go home, yep. right? And his mail, the, the, the money bail system mm -hmm. has nothing to do, and the public needs to understand it and tell your elected officials that you understand it does nothing to keep you safe. All it does is keep poor people in jail and let dangerous people who have money out. Yep. So we, 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 will, we have made some progress. We will continue to make progress as long as these uh, evidence-based practices are followed. Um, there has been an uptick in crime, particularly, mm -hmm. I think, in some violent crime. I do think the community needs to ask itself the causes of that crime. The criminal justice system is really a reactionary system. That crime has already happened by the time we, we deal with it. We have to ask ourselves, what are we doing once that person comes in? Are we doing more harm? And, 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 and making matters worse before that person re-enters your community. But the community really needs to ask itself, what are the conditions in our community in housing, in education, in employment that are driving some of that crime? And then we'll see greater reductions. Robin, can I ask you? Sure. I don't know the, the correlation, if you will, between the uptick in, in, our, in our jail and, uh, and the uptick in crime. I think that's yet to be, to, determined, so it's, it's important to know or recognize what we don't know. Um, to, to, uh, to Kevin's point, it is offensive to me uh, as a prosecutor that uh, there are folks in jail simply because they couldn't afford to get out. It is equally offensive to me that a dangerous, wealthy person can be out walking our streets. That's a problem. And that's what uh, we are trying to address with the Safety and Justice Challenge. Some of our strategies, uh, like our failure to comply, folks who, who fail to comply, say, with a money judgment or with, with a court uh, cost or fee or fine or something like that, uh, historically, they're, if they fail to comply, uh, an order for arrest is issued for them. And they get right back into the system that they couldn't afford to engage in the first place. And so we're working uh, with those types of strategies to recognize that when you have someone who couldn't afford it in the first place, let's not put them back in the system to make sure they can't afford it a second time. 
Uh, so those are the types of strategies we're working on. We're also working on um, case processing and, and within the case processing arena, working on a program uh, that we have here in Charlotte called Fast Track. Uh, it is where someone who is uh, in custody because they couldn't uh, afford to get out and, and uh, perhaps were not dangerous, uh, and they have a plea offer from the district attorney's office, and that plea offer contemplates probation or something less than incarceration. Uh, we try to get those cases on more quickly so that those folks can be taken care of and get out of the jail, right? Get out and, and uh, perhaps go back to uh, th their families, their lives, uh, and hopefully some opportunities. To talk about the upward mobility issue, and Kevin brought it up with housing and education, look, it's not lost on, uh, on me and I hope any prosecutor in our office that the decisions that we make every single day affect people's lives. And it doesn't just affect whether they're in jail or whether they're at home or whether they're gonna be on probation, but it affects whether they're gonna be able to go to school or get a job or get housing and have those types of opportunities. One of the things that, uh, that we've engaged in is working uh, with community advocates uh, in the um, expunction clinics. And it's not that I'm there as a prosecutor getting advice, giving advice to people who want to get their cases expunged, but I'm there simply to accept service of their expunction yeah. paperwork to move their process along and make it easier for them. And we found that very favorable. So Judge, to Kevin's point, I mean, I think a, a lot of communities are grappling with the issue of how do you tie pretrial incarceration to risk, not to financial vulnerability? How, how do you ensure that people, I think two-thirds of your people in the jail are, are in a pretrial situation. Yeah. How do you ensure that the ones who are there are the ones who are, who are a potential risk to the community, not just those who can't afford to get out? What, what are the barriers to getting to that? It seems to make sense from a lot of different perspectives. What, what, what are the big obstacles to getting there? Well, you know, there's no barrier to it right now. In fact, uh, Mecklenburg County has adopted the use of a risk assessment mm -hmm. tool uh, uh, that uh, we uh, obtained from the Arnold Foundation, and it makes an assessment of each individual as far as what their risk of of once the charge is filed, what's their risk of getting into more trouble mm -hmm. if we let them out of jail? And secondly, what's their uh, risk of not showing up for court? And, uh, and it's pretty objective, you know, in its use. It's also been um, uh, adjusted to take into account uh, things like poverty and, and, and things of that nature. And uh, so we, we've done this, and, and yes, we, we, when we implemented it uh, and made it part of our uh, pretrial release policy, we reduced, we were well over mm. 2,500 uh, people mm. in jail on any given day. Right. To, to, we dropped that down to 1,300 right, at one right, point. Right. And, uh, and then we were told the crime rate's gone up. And so we ticked back up to about 1,700, right. which is where we are now. But the judges are using the tool, and we're trying our best, you know, it's just the tool, because other things happen. I'm the only elected official up here right now. Yeah. No voter has come to me and said, you need to let more people out of jail. That's not associated with the court system. Um, <laughs> you know, and so as an elected official, we respond to that. We, we have community groups that come and sit in our courtroom, and they're listening to the way we uh, set bonds or conditions of release. And they're there to tell me that a 16-year-old 16 16 who uh, got suspended from school and was home all day and started breaking into people's homes, allegedly. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Mm needs to go to jail right away, needs to stay in jail. And we have to remind them that under our system of justice, a person charged with a crime is innocent until proven guilty. And that maybe that kid needs to be sent home with certain things put in place where he gets better supervision, 
He's told that he has to go to school every day and we're going to monitor that. And all of these things need to take place. But, you know, the simple answer is if you're charged with breaking and entering, your bond, no matter what your age is, no matter what your financial status is, should be this amount of money that you have to come up with. Well, 16-year-old is not going to yeah. come up with $500. The parents are going to come up with that. And I can't tell on any given day, because I'm, these are not, we're not treating these as juveniles until 2019, on any given day, a kid that's uh, standing in front of me, that his parents have the ability to come up with $500 to get him out of jail. So, but that's the way, that's the system we have right now. That's how we do things. And, and it needs to be changed, and, and I should say this. We have a meeting once a month with the key court officials, as we call ourselves. Uh, the public defender, the district attorney, our elected clerk of court, and the sheriff actually comes uh, to our meetings now, and uh, the senior uh, resident superior court judge, and of course, the most important person in the group, me. Mm -hmm. And we talk about these issues. You know, I get a daily report on what our jail population is. I get the statistics on the breakdown of race, mm -hmm. charges, and all those things. And I'm sitting there examining that and trying to figure out what's going on here. I haven't come up with an answer, Robert. I agree with pretty much everything that Judge Miller said except for one point, and that's if you're a judge, I get that you're a politician, but your decisions on doing stuff shouldn't be tied to calls from the people. Because judges, even though they're elected, are umpires and not elected officials and shouldn't be influenced by people's calls. But secondly, on the risk part, the issue that I have with even the risk assessment, I waited my whole life to be on a grand jury because I'm an activist. I was like, yes, I want to be on a grand jury. It took me to 48 years old for finally to get the letter. So I went, to, went down there and the judge said, I want to hear from anybody that can't be on the jury. I was the only one who didn't raise my hand because I wanted to be on it because I wanted to see the process. <laughs> and what I saw when I got there to be in the process is how unfair the charging is of people, especially poor people. And that, I don't know how it figures into the risk assessment. So I go in the store and I steal one candy bar. So it should be one charge for stealing a candy bar. But when it comes to us with the grant to do the grand jury, that one candy bar is four charges. I got the charge for stealing the candy bar. I got a charge for stealing the candy bar in the school zone. I got a charge for <laughs> stealing the candy bar after five o'clock. And I got a, another charge. So now, instead of just one charge, we at the grand jury got four charges on one Ooh. person. And that goes, how does that figure into the risk assessment? Because now the person looks and says, this person's got to be horrible. He's been charged with 16 different crimes, <laughs> but he only did two things. Can, yeah, can yeah, and, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the risk assessment, and, and you know, I'm not uh, all in on, on our particular one, but, but what it has done has changed the judge's focus. And what is supposed to be happening in that situation is the judge is not to look at the fact that there are four charges, but to look at the person and, and evaluate the risk of that person to the community. And, and we are making some progress in that. I want to uh, make, highlight one thing because our jail population did cut in about half. We were yeah. at 2,700, got down to about 1,300. This community was getting ready to build a $580 million new jail because the jails were at capacity. Um, but because some of these things have taken place, the, the jails got down to about half full that we have. That happened three years ago. Our crime rate during that three years went down. So I don't want anybody walking away with the impression Ooh. that the efforts that were made to bring the jail population down caused some rise in crime. It did not. And that is, that is why I think the MacArthur Foundation was, was very intentional in naming their challenge the safety and justice Ooh. challenge. Mm -hmm. It is about doing things better without making our community uh, at risk. Mark, Mark you, see, you see this from the other perspective, from the, the point of view of families who may be dealing with an incarcerated member, either a child or a, or a parent. What is the, and when we talk about the fact that two thirds of the people in the jail are simply just waiting, you know, they have, been, they have not been convicted, they're, they're, they're in a pretrial situation. What is the impact on families uh, of that kind of uh, uh, pattern? 
Well, <clears throat> I don't know if this mic is on. Typically, I don't need a mic. Yes, I think the mic's on. Okay. Um, okay, so let's put this in perspective. Um, we're saying two-thirds of the population are pretrial just sitting there. Okay, if this is the population of youth that, that we deal with, we're talking under the age of 18 years old. That's a teenager that's sitting there. That teenager is sitting there basically within their soul, they are dying. They're sitting in an adult situation trying to process it as a child. I was in the military for 22 years, a retired senior chief. I had a conversation with our youth a um, week before last and used the analogy of this. If you put a backpack on your back, because mo most kids like to carry a backpack, got all the, the shoes and electronics and all that good stuff in there. I say that backpack weighed 15 pounds. For a teenager, that's fine to carry. But I asked them to try to put that backpack on an infant. And what would it do? When these children or people in general are sitting there in incarceration with their lives on hold, they are carrying a weight they're not built to carry. Mm. And how do you rebound from that? So now the entire family is impacted by this. You know, if it's the young child, let's say it's the only child, uh, only son. Um, for most cases, he is that security in the home even at 17, 18, 16, 17 years old. Now his entire family is vulnerable. The impact that it has on children and anybody who's incarcerated sitting there that long, when they get back out, we live in a throwaway society. People will just throw you away if you make one mistake. They will, we're, not, we're not in that place of compassion where I would like to see us become where we restart the healing process and look at people as individuals and humans opposing mistakes that they made. Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> let's go to the audience for a couple questions. Uh, and I see one right in the middle here. There you go, standing up. My name is Alma Moore. I'm program coordinator for Dash Mentoring. That's my right hand, Marcus, for Mecklenburg County. Something that's missing in this piece is the issue of mental illness. Yeah. When did jails become repositories for mentally ill right. people? Right. That, that's a result of depression, anxiety, from being poor, as Bree said, you know, it's a systematic thing. So if you're worried about how you're going to have lights on, if you're homeless, the families that Marcus and I deal with have all kinds of issues. You know, the one-year mentoring program, just mentor some kids and find some mentors. Yeah. Gee, the family situations that we have, it's households of mentally ill people, and these kids are trying to survive. They're good kids. Just last week, we went to court, Marcus' connection with Colonel Williams at Tar Heel Challenge. This young man, was a victim of his mother's choice of men in domestic violence, so the whole household needs therapy, and they're getting it now. The colonel and his deputy director came in the courtroom and says, we are accepting him the first time, y'all, in the history of a juvenile court situation. And the, and the, the court counsel say, lock him up, go to the YDC. This child will go to Tar Heel on the 22nd. So, it was like we were yep. the demons for trying to give that child one more sense of hope. What do you all yep. do to address mental illness? There are a lot of, lot of communities where the sheriffs and the jail feel as though they're the mental health provider of last resort. Is that what you see here as well? Well, you know, <clears throat> um, mental illness is complicated. You know, there, there are you know, no simple mm. <laughs> answers to, to very complex issues. So first of all, uh, a policeman encounters uh, someone who has, uh, someone's uh, alleged has committed a crime. Now, I don't think that our police officers can make a mental health assessment when they come into contact with that individual. Uh, in fact, uh, as enlightened as our sheriff is and, and the programs that, that uh, he has in his jail right now, there is no one on that front end, particularly with adults charged with crime, who is making an assessment 
of the mental health of a particular individual who's been charged with a crime. Now, the first time the court may hear about that is from one of the public defenders who's interviewed the person, who's gone and done a background study, who's asked questions about mental illness and hospitalizations and things like that. And so they uh, make that initial assessment. But again, they are not experts in this area. And so with respect to someone who's charged with a crime, it's very hard for us to put into place a resources that assist that person, doesn't harm the person as they are in the system. Can, can, can I respond to that? In, in, I agree uh, that there are no simple answers, but there is one simple answer, that the court system and the jail is not the place to deal with mental mm -hmm. illness. Yep. Okay, and that is exactly what we're doing for some of the reasons that the judge just described. Um, it does highlight the role of the defense, that we are the people who are in contact with the, the people who come into the system and we can make them human, right? We hear about processing cases. These are not cases, these are people. And, and we have to remind the system to, to rehumanize. It's ridiculous that we have to say that, rehumanize the people who are coming through the system. So, uh, the, but the court system does not have the resources to deal with it. We do raise it. There are people who will recognize it but we don't have any resources to deal with it. I think the community needs to speak to your elected officials and say, that is absurd. We need to build the resources to deal with mental health in our community so it doesn't reach the jail. Robert, I know you want to weigh in on this, but I want to, I want to add one thing to the mix as we have to cede the stage shortly to our next uh, panelist. Uh, policy at the jail and incarceration are only one element of the criminal justice uh, picture in any community the Keith Lamont Scott shooting. C can you talk about what has changed in policing since then and what hasn't and should and add anything you want to on this question of mental illness? Sure, so first I'll do the mental illness part. I think that all police officers need to be having CIT training, which we've asked Charlotte police to do. Still have not seen a report on it. We've been asking for it now for a year and a half. Ask them. Uh, for, the, for the sheriff's department and all, they shouldn't be experts in anything, but if you can devote as much time to finding a person's mental status as you do their immigration status, maybe that would be a place to start. As far as, as far as what's changed since Keith Lamont Scott, not much, but there's been some light at the end of the tunnel. Hasn't been as much on the police department as it has been from our judicial system. One of the biggest things that we were requesting at SAFE and ACLU and all of us was better access and transparency to video. Um, the police department itself has not fought the release of video uh, since then. The judicial system has granted the release of all video that's been asked for since then. Those are pluses. The minuses is we had just dealt with uh, some of the things that we saw doing Keith Lamont Scott the year before. We passed what was called a civil liberties resolution which said how you're supposed to interact with protesters. That wasn't followed. We um, asked for less subjectivity in arrest. What are you arresting a person for? That wasn't followed. During the, uh, during the Keith Lamont Scott case, uh, the judicial system again had to step in. The police department arrested people on all kinds of charges. One person was standing here and they got arrested for inciting a riot. The person beside him that did the same thing got charged with disturbing the peace. The arrests were so subjective that when it got to court, pretty much all of the cases got thrown out. So we do see a lot of passing things on paper, which has been the Charlotte model. We see you're upset, so we're gonna pass this, but then they never implemented it. Marcus, I'm gonna give you the final word. Sure. I just wanted to speak to the mental health piece. Yeah. And I know it's a, a large piece, but it's a real piece. And it has its place. I'm six foot five, 300 pounds. What happens when I step out every day and I interact with law enforcement? I can tell you, I lived it. And it's not pretty. When they look at me, I'm an immediate threat. They don't see the grandfather in me. They don't see the son in me. They don't see the husband in me, the friend. They don't see that. Immediately, they go for protection mode. If that's happening to me on a regular basis, what's happening to our young men on a regular basis? 
So with the mental health component, I completely agree. The, the city and the leadership, not just in Charlotte, we've got to take a round turn on humanity because we've disconnected from what humanity is. To look across and see a person as a person. Until we start doing that, start doing that, we can continue to miss the mark. So it's an individual choice. All of us take that individual choice and look across and see the person inside the person. Be willing to do that first. And, and with that injunction to all of us, would you join me in thanking this terrific panel? Thank you all. We can go that way.